Hello, everyone. Sorry, uh, hope you all enjoyed lunch. Uh, we're just about ready to start the next um, set of panels. Um, really quickly, my name is Brooke Chambers. I'm a sociology and PhD student in the department. And I'm Bree Waters, and I am also a um, PhD student in the sociology department. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, so first up, we have Laura Zell. Um, she is the Director of Tolerance Minnesota, a program of the Jewish Community Relations Council. As Director, Zell created a program to capture and publish Holocaust survivor stories, including, uh, including five locally produced films with teacher resources. Two of the documentaries, In the Shadows of the Acropolis and But Some Survive, received national telly awards. Zell is founding director and CEO of Tolerance in Motion and is also co curator of Transfer of Memory of Traveling Photography. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you again for inviting me um, to give my perspective. I'm a program director, um, and it's, it's pretty significant that the name of our agency, which is the Jewish Community Relations Council. And under that, I um, write grants to support Holocaust education across Minnesota and the Dakotas, which is a wide territory to cover. Uh, I'm a former educator, and as much as I can, I'm devoted to bringing programs, resources, opportunities um, to teachers at a reduced or free um, rate, which is very important for schools today, um, and to students and um, I'll get to talk a little bit about some of those experiences. Our approach at the JCRC falls under three categories. One is education, second one is remembrance, because it's the Jewish part of our name, and the third is about building relationships and why that's so significant for us to do this kind of work. Under the education piece, um, I just thought it'd be easier to show you a little bit of my website, uh, our website. Um, we, as much as I can, have a healthy budget to bring in opportunities around the arts or create resources that, um, first and foremost, put testimony, survivor testimony, front and center. Um, and this is an example, just real quick, and I, I won't go into it, and here's a little bit about some other programming we do. One of them is that middle one called Transfer of Memory, which is a very, really simple um, photography exhibit with vignettes of the survivor stories. Um, we, we asked for volunteers, survivors self-selected, we didn't. We didn't say, please, you know, you, 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 and you. We thought it would just kind of allow people to, um, I don't know, wel welcome this opportunity. But one thing that this photography exhibit has done is it's allowed small communities with very low budgets to house this, and then we do a month of programming for them where I'll go and speak. My boss, who is an expert in many fields, including anti-Semitism, will go and speak. We'll have panel discussions. We'll have survivors speak. Um, communities, small communities often want how is this relevant to their community and so we've had panel discussions with um, new immigrants in their communities and issues they're dealing with. So it really opens up a nice um, month of programming at the host sites. Um, I can tell you, so, so there are other things we do where we have a trip, we have survivors that go in to speak, um, into schools. I can tell you a couple of things that I've learned. Um, I am often surprised that, that I've learned that I cannot take anything for granted of where people are when I walk into the room to talk about the Holocaust or to talk about anti-Semitism. Um, for example, we just did a professional development opportunity for law enforcement and we're told by one of the supervisors that one of the veteran officers did not think it was important to learn about the Holocaust because he did not believe that it happened. And we were completely thrown off by that. Um, completely. We would So one of the things I've learned is to really take some time and learn about your audience, um, learn about maybe some issues going on internally. Um, 
Another uh, thing I've learned, or another example of why it's so important to do that, is um, there was a situation locally in southern Minnesota where very well-intentioned teachers staged a simulation where um, the teachers were the Nazis, the kids were the Jews, and the parent PTA um, were the guards, were also some guards, like Ground Truth SS. And um, so these are situations that we get called, we get these calls at the GCRC, we have a community security department, we have casework, um, and so we get these calls with parents, students, principals sometimes saying, come, can you have a conversation with us? What should we do? And so that's how we enter this subject. I can also tell you another example that has been very positive is um, when we place survivors in schools. Um, I think it's one of the richest experiences still. As much as we can, we will drive survivors hours. We'll put them on a plane to the Dakotas. Um, we've had survivors speak at St. Joseph Indian Boarding School a few times in the Dakotas in South Dakota. Um, and we always get letters back from the students. And there's one letter that sticks with me in particular. That was a woman who um, spoke, Eva Gross spoke, and she had was a survivor of five different concentration camps. And there's a letter from a fourth grader. Now, usually we don't have kids, we don't place survivors in schools with kids this young, this young, but she was speaking and, and um, to the upper elementary school and the, the school allowed the fourth graders to go in. And this girl was a new, um, new American who had come from an African country and where there had been civil war. And her letter very simply says, thank you for talking, Eva. Um, I too have felt the feelings that you expressed and you have given me hope. I mean, it was just very simple and I thought, okay, that is one of my favorite letters. Um, and as far as, re I'm sorry, thank you. So the remembrance side of the JCRC deals a lot with our survivor communities and the families and their descendants. And um, <coughs> we have grappled with um, people saying, well, what happens when there's no more survivors to go into schools? Because you know that, that dialogue and that interchange and that um, feeling that students get, you know, how do you replace that? So we have leaned heavily on descendants of Holocaust survivors, their children, their grandchildren, and we have organized a group called Generations After, and they are taking time to get to know their family story, to put it in context of the country, the year, the, you know, get, get, take some time and get some history around it, and then be able to really walk in and answer some of the very difficult questions that arise about anti-Semitism, about Israel, um, and so we're taking some time with those family members to get themselves organized. And then as far as building relationships, this is, cannot be taken for granted. So we are often the Jewish agency that's called to do some interfaith, intercultural work, whether it's at the legislative level, whether it's at a school district level. Um, and we are trying as authentically as we can to show up with no particular agenda, but to be, to allow people to ask us questions, to work together, um, to find the commonality, to, to just really um, be a, a, a trusted advisor in many different situations. So for example, the Armenian church um, here in Minnesota, um, St. Sahad, I believe it's called, um, we um, meet with Father often, and um, after talking about transfer of memory, we're, he asked us, you know, how do we, can we have some conversations with a local photographer, or how do we begin to tap into some of the descendants that may be living in Minnesota, because the thing about transfer of memory, transfer of memory is they're all Minnesota stories. Um, so we're happy, again, to maybe provide some structure and maybe some funding to do that. Um, another example of building relationships is with um, the American Swedish Institute. 
and we just housed a, a or held a uh, workshop called Norway in the Holocaust, and they we collaborated. Um, there was a background obviously given on on the the role those countries the countries played um, during the war, and then we also invited um, Kristen Thompson from USHMM to come in and do a segment on oath and opposition. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this. It was the educator's role during the rise of the third, right? And she has done a beautiful job putting together um, really um, important and, and, and small, a small unit for teachers to teach about that. The other, um, my, the last thing I'll, I'll mention about building relationships and why it's so important is, and, and my boss Steve Hunnix does this extremely well, is that almost every relationship that he's in, he talks about anti-Semitism. And he talks about the role it plays um, for the Jewish people in the past and today. And those conversations are not easy to have, but he um, is really, really talented at doing that and is working with um, the Archbishop, um, he meets regularly with people across the Dakotas, politicians, um, to really bring this issue forefront and, and have a trusted advisor to have those types of com conversations. I believe I'm down. Okay, did I do it? Okay. <laughs> This um, is loud enough. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Kathy. Our next um, presenter is Dan Spock, and he is the director of the Minnesota History Center Museum, um, part of the Minnesota Historical Society. Spock is an ardent advocate for participatory museum programs suffused with pluralism and informed by visitor research. Under his leadership, the Minnesota Historical Society has explored the informal means by which the public experiences and values the past as natural pathways for engaging with history in a museum context. Spock has consulted and lectured at a variety of museum and learning institutions and has published writings on many museum subjects. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm sorry I nope. barged in. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about... Yeah, I've got a... Um, right, so what, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a project that, um, that we started um, over eight or nine years ago. And um, the, the, the question that was in front of us is what was our responsibility as a historical organization um, around the impending commemoration of the U.S. Dakota War of 1862? Um, and I, I'm going to regret already with this short amount of time that I'm going to I'm going to make everything way um, uh, shorter uh, in terms of a very complex story here than it really um, uh, deserves. But um, I'm going to blow through some slides. Um, I think the first um, thing to point out um, is that uh, there was a lot of anxiety in our institution about taking this on. We knew it was politically freighted and charged, um, and, and yet there was a growing consensus within our organization that we could not leave this opportunity and let it go by, which we uh, very easily could have done. We could have stood on the sidelines and, and chosen not to do anything in commemoration with this. I think the other thing is that after over two decades of work with Native peoples, we knew that this wasn't a story that we could tell alone. Um, that we couldn't just be in some committee room, um, uh, that we had to uh, include Dakota people in the storytelling process, people that have traditionally been marginalized in the telling of the story, and that that um, would be the backbone of our effort um, going forward. Um, and, and in particular, I just want to call out the person on the left there, uh, Alameda Rocha, was somebody who had a vision that this uh, commemoration would, uh, would be um, 
be remembered. It would be an opportunity for Dakota people, most of whom do not live in their homeland anymore, but live across the West and into Canada uh, in, a, in a fragmented uh, series of reservations that is a residue of the genocidal policies of the United States. Um, that, that, that bringing people back to the homeland to experience a variety of cultural and historical activities, um, a, a program, an agenda um, determined by Dakota people for Dakota people. And, and part of our entree into this community was to throw our support behind what Dakota people wanted to do um, to commemorate the anniversary. And, uh, and I think one of the things I'd like to mention, and it sort of ties to uh, previous speakers' uh, remarks about the idea of historical memory, um, for many people who are not Dakota, this seems like a long time ago. Um, but when we, when we talk to Dakota people, they are still living in the colonial machinery. They live not only with historical trauma, but the legal frameworks and the cultural frameworks established by colonization <coughs> are still the world that they have to live with. And so part of the way they work through the historical trauma is through commemorative activities. And I have the story of my grandmother who, um, whose grandfather was a Civil War veteran. Uh, and she used to tell me stories that he told her. And so if you think about it that way, you know, we're only one storyteller away, even today, from direct experience with this, um, with this episode. Um, very quickly, to go through the history, um, one of the things that we felt we needed to acknowledge, the treaties were a co coercive land-taking pro uh, process. Um, it wasn't so much about um, uh, taking land and converting it into property, which was part of it, but it was specifically to convert property, um, uh, uh, Indian land into property that could be sold, okay? And, um, uh, and by the time of the war, through a series of treaties, Dakota people had seen their land base dwindle. Um, and what's often soft-pedaled in the traditional narratives is how coercive that process of successive treaties uh, was. Um, also not fully acknowledged are that, um, that reservations were really an assimilation machine. Um, the idea, um, the ideology of expansion was that Indians were supposed to disappear. And although um, the actual murder of in Indians was um, maybe something that was talked about at the margins of uh, American discourse through this time period, um, there, were, there, were, um, st there was still a prevailing idea that the only acceptable future for American Indians in North, North America would be that they would become culturally identical to Americans, that, they, that their fu future would be to be uh, Christianized and to, um, uh, and to become yeoman farmers in a sort of Jeffersonian uh, ideal. Um, oh, and the other thing is that um, the, uh, the administrative uh, machinery um, for, um, for um, uh, Indian policy was also rife with uh, corruption. So, um, so there was money to be made at, at virtually every level in how treaty making was, was done, with how, um, um, how reservations were administered, um, uh, and of course, um, Native people um, got, got the short end of the stick. Um, and so by the time the war breaks out in 1862, uh, one of the things that we heard over and over again from Dakota people is that don't talk about this as a war about um, eggs, because quite often the traditional narrative starts with the murder of some settlers in a township um, in western Minnesota. Um, um, this was really a culmination of decades of, of uh, policy and a, um, a, a breakdown in uh, the United States government's uh, fulfillment of promises made the treaties. Um, the rebellion did, itself did not last very long, uh, 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 a month and a half, um, but it concluded with the mass ex execution of 38 Dakota men simultaneously <coughs> the day after Christmas in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, and the um, execution order famously was drafted by Abraham Lincoln. So um, 
This is an episode that's often overshadowed because we're in the middle of, a, of the American Civil War uh, during this time. Um, but it is, um, it is not forgotten uh, by Dakota people, and the anniversary of this hanging is, uh, is commemorated by Dakota people every year uh, with, um, with a ceremony. Um, Historic Fort Snelling, which is one of the sites administered by the uh, Minnesota Historical Society, was the site of what we now call a concentration camp, a place where um, mostly non-combatant uh, imprisoned people after the war uh, were marched to in the um, fall and winter of 1862-63. Um, uh, 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 over 100 people, uh, we know for certain, uh, perished. Uh, in that camp before the following spring when they were, um, when they were uh, removed um, to a desolate um, reservation in South Dakota. Um, and uh, perhaps most famously, um, uh, our governor of the time, Alexander Ramsey, who not incidentally is the founding president of the Minnesota Historical Society, my organization, um, called for the extermination of Dakota people from Minnesota forever. Um, um, and one of the things I want to stress is that as an organization, to prepare for this project, one of the things that we had to do was educate ourselves on our own history and how it intersected um, with um, the lives of Dakota people. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for people in our organization to Interact, uh, to know less about this episode of history than the Dakota people that we're working with. And that had to be remedied before we could send people out and do this work. Um, so the complicity um, of the family, you know, us being part of that colonial um, infrastructure um, is, is really important. Um, as I said, Dakota people are scattered um, across the West and into Canada as a result of this um, clash. Um, so, um, you know, how did we tackle this? How would we tackle this as an organization? We had a few um, uh, values um, that we uh, tried to follow, to be inclusive, um, to really listen. Um, I think when we talk with, um, with Native people uh, most generally, the thing that is uh, most distressing um, and makes the most cynical about working with organizations like ours is that the perception is that we come to them with pre-formulated ideas about how we want to uh, tell their history uh, and we're just looking for a checkoff or a rubber stamp, as they say, um, uh, to do this work. So, um, I've got to uh, go here. But um, I should just say I have a handout for everybody that will cover more, uh, more of this in detail. Um, so um, we had a number of uh, roundtable sessions um, to talk about how the interpretation uh, would go. Um, we also um, didn't um, assume that uh, bringing everybody to St. Paul was acceptable. Um, so we made uh, trips to um, uh, the places outside of Minnesota where uh, most of the people live uh, today. Um, and we also made sure that this wasn't just consigned to our um, our ground troops, but that it would be something that um, leadership would participate in as well. Um, we did our, uh, uh, an exhibit in draft form first and solicited, uh, solicited comments with post-its. Uh, we got a lot of them. Um, and then we made uh, a number of, we, we treated this information as actionable. So rather than um, go through the motions and then do what we were going to do anyway, um, we followed um, um, the advice as a way of showing that we were really serious about listening um, um, to our Dakota informants. Um, one of the things that became very important um, in the conversations was our collections. Um, and there was a sense that trust couldn't be, um, couldn't be found with our organization unless we were completely transparent about what we had as our holdings. Um, Dakota people tend to see institutions like ours as part of the colonial machinery, as takers of things, of takers and keepers of things. So access to those things that were Dakota um, was important. We couldn't show anything um, and still um, 
um, expect their participation until they felt that our collections were completely transparent. Um, we built a website, which still exists, which um, I encourage everybody to go to, um, which includes um, um, dozens of oral histories, um, video content, um, um, and um, is uh, in heavy use still in, in uh, the public schools. Um, and then we supported four years of, um, of conferences um, uh, led by Alameda Rocha, uh, where, where people could go to sacred sites around the cities. Um, uh, again, uh, a Dakota-driven agenda. Um, and then we also um, supported some activities in um, uh, South Dakota. Um, with our exhibit, we had the opportunity for um, visitor feedback, and we really wanted to make sure that the affective uh, dimension, how this uh, made people feel, was accounted for in some sort of way. And we really struggled about, you know, what's the best question to ask. Um, but I would just um, um, maybe close with the uh, with um, this particular word cloud shows, um, you know, what sorts of responses um, people were having. And I have to say that. Um, that one of the things I've taken away from this experience and feel very strongly about is that um, the, 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 the fact that shame looms loom so large uh, in people's takeaway as a pedagogue, you know, shame is not necessarily the best platform for learning. Um, and so how do you get to a place um, where people are not internalizing um, a sense of um, sense of shame or guilt about the past, but are thinking about how what they've learned can be a platform uh, for the future. Um, and so what now? Often efforts like this just die the minute the exhibit opens, right? Um, and so um, part of our, um, our commitment as an institution is to make sure that these relationships are maintained, uh, that we continue to work on things that Dakota people want to see us do and that will also, I think, significantly inform um, what we do with historic Fort Snelling, a site that for 40 years is silent on the issue of the U.S. Dakota War and uh, U.S. policies um, in this region. Um, um, and I guess the, the only other thing to, um, to point out is that as an institution, we are now using the term concentration camp <coughs> refer to the camp at, at Fort Snelling, and also we are using the term <coughs> genocide, which is a very controversial decision. Um, um, there's a lot of debate about uh, whether what happened um, to Native peoples in the United States, um, whether or not it's genocide, we'll talk about that later. But, um, but we have decided that by any definition, um, United States policies toward Native people were genocidal. There, there were genocidal things said, the ideology was genocidal, and if enough of those things are added together, you have to acknowledge um, that this was uh, genocidal. So, thank you. Thank you. to introduce our next speaker, um, Dan Wilkinson, PhD, is the Director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Education and a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at St. Cloud State University. He teaches courses in anti-Semitism, Holocaust literature, ethics, rhetoric, and is working with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and local school districts in the St. Cloud area to develop a program in civic leadership using lessons of the Holocaust and other genocides. Genocide studies, 
In addition to many other influences, my approach to this task is shaped by three factors. Um, my academic discipline is rhetoric and communication studies, uh, which should become more apparent toward the end of my remarks. And second, my two-year stint as the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning uh, developed my appreciation for the impact of institutional and budgetary limitations on faculty academic expertise, particularly in the field of Holocaust and genocide education. We don't have the kind of, we don't have the size of university or the budget to hire people who actually can step into a position in one of these areas. So we've relied upon um, external money and other opportunities um, for people to develop expertise as they're in place. I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm looking over at Kathleen Robinson over here and Joy Schoberg. Joy just left St. Cloud Technical and Community Colleges and Kathleen is taking her place on uh, teaching in these subject areas. And both of them have developed expertise without a, a specific degree in that area. And so how that, how an institution recognizes and rewards those uh, developments uh, professionally and acknowledges their credential is something that um, an institution must do. Um, and third, I feel obliged to account for the nature of my position in the pedagogical enterprise of Holocaust and genocide education as a faculty director of a center, uh, not for the study of, uh, but for the education about Holocaust and genocide. Um, our center is the only such center in the Minnesota State University system. Uh, and Due to complications, um, I have not been able to attend every one of the uh, presentations, um, but I've benefited greatly from all of those that I've been at. And um, I want to thank Alejandro and Joaquin for inviting me and for the U of M team for hosting us. Um, a lot of things go into the delivery of an, a conference like this, and um, I'm well aware of those things. And often the people who work uh, behind the scenes don't get recognition. So I want to thank you all for everything that you've done. Um, I will be uh, taking a broader, more contextual view of education, um, one that will enable me to comment on challenges uh, facing curriculum. Uh, the center does not have any oversight over curriculum. Um, the only courses on Holocaust and genocide are distributed across the university, English, history, um, human relations, um, and some other departments. And um, the only way that we could address issues that might arise in content would be to make an appeal to the department. So for example, the history department hired someone to teach a <coughs> Holocaust history course, which ended up being really a course on Holocaust denial. Um, the center did the same thing except for making an appeal to the department. Um, fortunately, that guy's long gone. So, um, um, I also uh, have to pay attention to programming and mission. And this is a campus responsibility because anything that I do has a, has a ripple effect. Um, so the center's name changed from the Center for Holocaust Education to the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Education with the idea that we were going to talk about more genocides than just the one that occurred during the Holocaust. This causes all sorts of political issues related to the things that we've been talking about the last couple of days. Um, it also creates an appetite for people who want to glom onto uh, the energy of the center, the name of the center, and so I get visits from people all the time, things under my door from a guy who is a local Catholic um, who um, is sure that the Jews and Muslims are going to hell and reminds me of that by email and written form uh, at least once a month. Um, he's knocked on my door, tries to monopolize my time, um, and that's difficult. There's another guy who actually has made um, YouTube videos and um, has tried to actually enlist the center in supporting his um, fight against abortion, or what he calls the American genocide. Um, <clears throat> another interesting feature of the center is that it also invites, uh, not explicitly, but it invites people to come and knock on the door who are refugees. So I've had several Syrians actually come to my door, can you help me? Specifically asking for money and asking for some kind of legal recourse 
Um, I've had similar inquiries from uh, Ethiopians and Somalians, um, and the, some members of the Hmong community have visited me and asked me for programming. Um, I am the only entity, human entity, in the center. I have no interns. I have no assistants. I just this year got a third of an office manager to handle the meager budget that we have. Um, and I'm in trouble now because the uh, scholar from the American University at Phnom Penh, um, Teresa DeLangus, who is doing an incredible study on um, women survivors of the Cambodian genocide uh, who are bringing, I was informed earlier this week that we don't have money to pay per contract. Um, so uh, there, there's some juggling around uh, that I have to do to make that happen, but I, this is, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm more interested in all the ideas you've been talking about, but, you know, when, it, when you live every day um, doing this work, there are other dimensions to um, its seriousness. But I was informed by the provost office that they believe the work of the center is so important that they're not going to cut it, which tells me something. And they're giving me an opportunity to have a couple extra duty days to write some grants. Um, finally, um, I also will be touching on uh, teaching and learning and um, what that experience has been. Most of my assignment is as the director, um, and I've just uh, been asked to add an additional course on teaching two courses on anti-Semitism uh, beginning in the fall as part of my general load. Um, I need to say that the nature of academic inquiry is typically Attached an abstract clinical almost orderly representation of what in reality is messy and confusing. And so when we're talking about education, and some of the things that I'll be saying really talk about um, what happens in the mess in the classroom. Um, it's an expression of the human condition uh, described by Kenneth Burke as the impulse um, uh, to be a simple using and misusing animal. Uh, to separate ourselves from a natural condition by instruments of our own making. This is what we've been doing. We're distant from it. We're almost clinical in the way we talk about it. I was at the USHMM, and we were talking about use of video, and there was a woman who had just been shot that was dropped into the pit. And uh, the woman who was the uh, curator at the museum um, and working with that particular collection showed that image, ran over that image probably 20 times as we were analyzing how it might be used in the classroom. And there's something about that process that, that is troubling to me. And the story that I'm going to end with today maybe will create some trouble for you as well. Um, my remarks uh, come from a perspective that's informed by scholarship on Holocaust and genocide studies. But uh, what's to follow is probably should be considered as more um, as a screenplay or vignettes um, a, illustrating the things that we have been talking about the last couple days. Basic outline is to identify uh, three chief challenges and to focus in on one in particular. It was going to be um, substantially on the Native American situation, but um, I'm going to modify that a little bit because Dan did such a great job unpacking that. Um, so the first challenge that I've seen um, in my teaching and programming and everything else is uh, something that could be called anti-comparison or conflation. It is a momentum abandoning the kind of careful comparisons encouraged by Snyder in his lecture. It includes but is more than the mere resistance to complexity that instructors experience typically from students who lack preparation, effort, or sufficient development. It is the tendency to merge various scales of atrocity for example, the bludgeoning of 75 residents with, a, with farm implements on the outskirts of a town versus the shooting of thousands into an open pit. The pedagogical issue in this cannot be addressed without consideration of the students and what they bring to the course encounter. Often too many assumptions are made by a professor. I've had a variety of experiences. Students have dropped the course because it was quote unquote too much. They've broken down in class. Uh, told me in a later email that they would be missing class for a couple of days because they couldn't separate the heartlessness of Eichmann from the heartlessness of their father. The MO of the academic when applied to Holocaust and genocide can sometimes seem to be absurd to students who come as refugees from regions of conflict. 
a young woman from an African community, count, uh, African country, um, in an upper level genocide course in which I was giving a guest lecture, challenged my presentation of Greg Stanton's eight, their now stages of genocide. But the scar that I then noticed across her cheek was the main message that was only accentuated by her question, isn't killing just killing? This is obviously a difficult question to answer. For me, her statement, conflating these genocides was less an academic error than a moral petition. And I'm tempted here to say uh, something sarcastic about walls and borders and how we can prevent such questions, but um, I'll not go there. The true breadth of diversity in a university classroom presents a huge problem with many dimensions and requires a, a range of adaptations that threaten any sense of coherence. The second uh, challenge is one of competition. We've already talked about this. A um, couple examples. Uh, St. Cloud doesn't have a vaccine for yellow fever, which I needed to go to Rwanda, so I had to go to the Boynton. Um, so the nurse of Ukrainian heritage asked what I did, and then while she was enthusiastically shoving the needle into my arm, she <laughs> said, yeah, you and your Holocaust, if you want to know about real suffering, you should study the whole of the more. Um, the people who put literature under our center's door and attempt to make, um, I completely forgot my slides, that's okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, actually, they're, they're pretty dramatic, and there are several that are, are really difficult to see, um, particularly in this section on competition. Um, but I'll just break away here and say that um, we had, in 2014, um, a group approached the university um, with a, something called the Genocide Awareness Project. And it was basically um, comparing um, the Nazis with the, the Nazi genocide, with um, Cambodian genocide, with the Rwanda genocide, with abortion. And they had very graphic photographs lining these things up. Actually, they have lynchings too of African Americans. And it was all set up in a quad area. Um, where all of these street theater experiences happen on our campus. And um, they have people barking through megaphones and other things. Um, and it was quite a disturbing scene. And the issue that came up for me in terms of programming and education was really um, when these things happen on our campus, as they happen in real life, what are we teaching our students about how to engage them meaningfully, how to respond to them? Are we helping them think through these things? And how are we helping them think through these things? And one of the issues that has come up for me in my discipline is really about how to think about language. And we use the word framing. Um, it's been used a lot here during the symposium. I would like to say that our discipline actually came up with that idea. Um, but I, I'm not that kind of a person. Um, I'm more than happy to share um, the love about that um, and the, the utility of that term. But if we would take that one uh, description that was on a previous slide of the U.S.-Dakota War, there are other ways of describing that. Uh, the Dakota Uprising, the, uh, the Sioux Uprising, the Sioux Outbreak of 1862, the Dakota Conflict, Little Crow's War, these are different things that show up in books all over the place. And if the language is not interrogated, if the language is not examined, it will begin to do the thinking for people. Um, I'm good? No, I'm that. pretty much almost done. Okay, so um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, end with, I'll end with this. Um, there was a guy who owned the land that I live on in the Lowry edition of St. Cloud. His name was Sylvanus Lowry, general. He used to be a mayor of St. Cloud. Um, he was referred to by Jane Gray Swissholm, who was an abolitionist, as a moccasin Democrat. Because he worked was a translator for the Ho-Chunk. And he actually was called to Washington to do some translation. Um, but he also threw into the Mississippi the um, printing press that Jane Gray Swisson used to publish her <laughs> abolitionist magazine. I had a student by the name of Mike in my uh, ethics class, I have to tell us. And, um, I, I was illustrating um, intuition and instinct as it somehow finds its way into making ethical decisions. 
and um, I was referring to a moment when my dog the previous night was having trouble wanting to go in, wanted to go out, and as it turns out a rabbit tried to get through the fence, the chain link fence. Got halfway through and died there because it couldn't get all the way through. Pretty grim, uh, just a rabbit though, right? Um, so I went out and I discovered this and uh, tried to figure out what to do because I couldn't just leave it there, so I got a shovel and cut it in half. Um, and I'm telling this in the class and applying it in different ways. And, and so he waits until after class and he comes up, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. Why didn't you cut the fence? And in that moment, I realized that what had happened to my worldview and how it had been constructed, how it had been lined up, my values, my priorities, my whole construction of what's important was already creating a pathway for my behavior. I had already talked myself into behaving in that way without even thinking about it. Um, and he, I listened to him, I listened to him. And if, if we can't have in this experience a site where there's code learning, um, United States History, Global Studies, Human Geography, and International Relations at an urban junior high and high school for over 25 years. She earned her Master's in Education and Social Studies and her Bachelor of Arts in History and French from the University of Minnesota. Um, Zimmer has participated in several workshops on genocide, including writing curriculum and co-facilitating a workshop. She has traveled extensively, visiting mass atrocity sites in Europe, South Africa, Cambodia, and the U.S. Cambodia and the U.S., so it's important. Thank you. Um, after that, wow, right? After a rabbit fence story, so it does make me think of um, during the Mexican War, I'm a U.S. history teacher primarily, but during the Mexican War, Henry David Thoreau didn't want to pay his taxes. Why would you want to support a government that in essence is, um, you know, created a war so that they can expand the institution of slavery into new territories? And so he was arrested and his friend came to see him in jail and supposedly, if this really happened, I think it did, um, his friend said, what are you doing in there? And he said to his friend, what are you doing out there? <coughs> Love that. Um, one of many heroes. Um, speaking of heroes, I'm going to actually start with something to do with heroes and people that make a difference. And um, as a teacher of middle school for many years, junior high and now high school, I can tell you that there's no way in hell, excuse me, but there's no way that kids would survive anything that we have done here the last few days. So I'm hopefully going to teach you guys a few things that you can do to uh, you know, think of mind breaks, brain breaks, stretching. Um, no, I know I only have a few minutes, but I'm going to ask that you stand up because that's important. You've been sitting for a long time. And um, while you're stretching right now, because that's a good thing, get that oxygen moving, I want you right now in your head to think about who, or maybe a few people, but at least one name, someone that you can think of that really made a difference in one of these, you know, atrocious uh, scenarios that we know about, whether it's the Holocaust, whether it's Rwanda, whether it's Cambodia, can you think of someone who Samantha Power and many others have called upstanders? So picture in your mind who that is. If you can picture, I have a few right here, and I will give them to one person in the group. And um, as you're thinking about it, the group is going to, you're going to start talking about that person in just a minute, and the group is going to try to figure out who this upstander is. But again, keep thinking, who's someone who's made a difference? They were an upstander. Did you guys get one? Yes, we did. Did I miss a table? 
Do you want us to talk about one who we thought of ourselves or the one you gave? Okay, so you thought of someone yourself. We, we don't have a lot of time, so maybe only a couple of people are going to be able to say something. So if there's someone who you thought of a person, sorry, um, please tell a little bit about that person. If you could not think of someone because you're put on the spot, then please, the person who has the paper, tell us a little bit about this person. So, sorry, let's make this only about two, three minutes. Go ahead. And keep standing. You need to stretch. <laughs> stand, stand, stand. No sitting right now. Stand. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't put it as uh, 
nicely as perhaps I should have, but you wouldn't survive in a classroom with 35, 13-year-olds if you talked the whole time and presented your paper or your lesson that way. So, you know, remember those kinds of things. Activities are really important. Um, at the conference, people were talking about challenges, your challenges of definitions and methods and theories and whether um, you know, the Holocaust comparison and inter intersectionality and all of these things and classroom teachers, our challenges are, okay, here we have 35 kids, 30 to 35, 25 to 35, obviously it kind of depends, but in there somewhere. Um, you know, with the hormones going crazy and all this stuff. So we're not looking at those things, we're looking at what are we gonna teach, how are we gonna teach it, why are we teaching it, and how are we going to keep these kids, you know, engaged? Um, we are definitely interested in the books and the papers and everything that's coming out, you know, um, and the methodologies, which the maps and things. Um, Holly love that. Starting to use some of those, by the way. Um, but it's a different world that we're looking at. And so, what we really, I think, what a lot of teachers want is. How can they take that information? How can they take the current research and then use it in their classrooms? Um, and I want to thank um, the Center for Genocide and Holocaust Studies here at the University of Minnesota and the Global Studies Center or Institute of Global Studies because they've really brought together a lot of programs and um, they've been able to have you know professors talk and they you know present their papers and their specialty in their fields. And then they have teachers meet and say, okay, how can we take this information? How can we write curriculum? How can we use this and uh, disseminate this for teachers to use? And I was able to do that in one particular program. And then later, uh, with Wakuntu, we facilitated a workshop last summer. And I'm just hoping that they might ask us back again. But <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I'm like, I you know, hopefully the class, yeah. <laughs> folks here from that class. Yeah. Um, but we do have a few other challenges as teachers too. Um, and I think me, uh, personally, I feel like I need to avoid the, um, what some people have called um, disaster porn or um, just that you know, dark tourism. I mean, since I've traveled to many places around the world um, and I tend to go to sites like this since I, I do teach this, but I don't want it to turn into, you know, Ooh, look at this grim, you know, look at this skull, look at this, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so I think teachers have to be very careful of that um, because there is that shock and awe factor and kids will be drawn to that, but we can't have that our focus. And so I think uh, my experience with my colleagues is the focus has been on the antecedents. I think, uh, wasn't it just, uh, Professor Weitz who was saying, that academics aren't focusing so much on the antecedents, they focus on the event. I think teachers focus so much on what happens before so that we can make connections with kids so they can see in their own lives how something as small as um, being apathetic to a, a situation that happens or to bullying or harassment can turn into something much worse when it's on an institutional scale. So I think um, many teachers are, you know, really address that aspect of it. Um, in my own class, and I know, you know, time, everyone's <laughs> on the clock. Um, in my own class, the way I try to teach um, this subject is the way I teach really any other subjects, whether it's U.S. history or international relations or whatever, is through more active approaches. And I definitely don't want Laura to think um, when I say simulations, I have never, <laughs> yeah. as a teacher, been the Nazi and the students be, you know, the targeted group. I mean, that's... Um, Pretty freaky, pretty scary. Um, but in most of my lessons, there's Socratic seminar, mock trials, role play, simulations. But in the case of a simulation, it would be more like a United Nations meeting discussing an incidence of mass atrocity. And then, what are the countries uh, that are present in the Security Council, for instance? What are they? What are they going to do about it? So the kids really are working with the issues. So it isn't always just looking at this is what happened in the past. This is how we deal with things now and um, for them to use their critical thinking skills um, and of course historical thinking, sourcing, contextualizing, continuity over change, those kinds of very important things. Um, I probably should end because we're, we're about it, but I, I do want to share something from a student. Um, I almost that I had these. I thought I'd bring the real stuff. Everything's electronic now, but sometimes it's really cool to, you know, kids still need to touch 
things. It cannot all be on the computer or the iPad or whatever, no matter what the people in the media department says, no, they still need to touch. So, um, as you can tell, this is a long story cloth. And so after having studied um, in, in our, my school, well, of course, Minnesota General, we have many, many librarians, we have many Hmong, we have many Somali, um, but this is what a student wanted to um, to express based, you know, based on the story of, of how people had to uh, leave their country from the Khmer Rouge. Um, History Day projects, which is a huge thing at um, the Minnesota Historical Society. Can you hold this up, please? Um, so this is something um, that students have done, and I, I love this idea that the student actually quoted me. <laughs> You know, of all the people that they could have yeah. quoted, they quoted me. But, you know, that's important because, sort, you know, you got to know your source and all that, so I'm really glad they learned that lesson. But it just is, you know, I just think that's hilarious. You know, not, nothing like little, maybe if I put her name in. <laughs> so they quoted me because I, I went to Auschwitz and I had made a comment about what I experienced when I was there. So that's an example. Um, but that's more like the younger ages. Um, Socratic seminar can be very deep. Um, well, because we have younger kids too, this is the last thing, and then I'll be done. Uh, this is after looking at the Socratic seminar of before, never again. And so we were looking at the Armenian genocide. And so a student wrote, this is a captured poem, when you take pieces from different readings or different documents. Democide and genocide, humanity has begun to die. Far and wide, morality has been cast aside. Overshadowed by the hatred inside, the Armenians were petrified. The young Turks set the stage to terrorize. To the tune of nationalism, the Ottomans began to classify, symbolize, and dehumanize. Ingeniously organized, the strong were first to die, the weak deprived. Mass deportations epitomized, nothing left but to deny, deny, deny. Safer than to reconcile, even devils need peace of mind. As Hitler said, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? The Holocaust polarized the Jews, men, women, and children shot cold, flickering signs of hope. Concentration camps filled with civilians, death camps eradicate millions, gas chambers ignite suffocation, simple means for extermination. Words cannot capture this inhumane disaster, yet the world seems mystified when faced with genocide. The U.S. still fails to ratify the term genocide for the Armenians. Since allowing the Jews to die, the art of the inhumanity has been typified. The Black Plague blinds our eyes. Uh, here in the U.S., in various places, but also beyond the U.S., 
war is a cover for what actually happened. And yeah. Often mm -hmm. people don't know this. And so it is uh, consciously and unconsciously yeah. kind of uh, eclipsing what, uh, the, what we are actually trying to convey. Right? Sure. So I'm wondering how you approach this. Well, if you think you know, about question that's marks. a really, really good question. And, um, and, uh, and the short answer to this is that we actually went through several iterations of exhibit title. But it was our Dakota informants who wanted the, the term war used. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that they felt that, that as a nation, as a sovereign nation, um, and uh, that they wanted acknowledgement that this was a clash between two nations. And, 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 uh, so, um, uh, and, and, I, and I have to say that that's not that's not um, a consensus among Dakota people, but the, but, um, but the, the, certainly the most articulate voices that we talked with um, um, supported that idea. And, and generally, there's a move away from conflict, which um, which seems to minimize um, um, the enormity of what happened. There's a move away upri from uprising, which makes it seem some, somewhat delegitimated. Um, but I have to say that that one of the, uh, the takeaways I have from the, the entire experience is the, the limits of the English language to appropriately describe what actually happened. Then. Dakota people have their own language and their own way of describing. And, uh, one of our informants um, recently was saying, you know, that the trouble with English is that it's a transactional language and it tends to objectify things and, um, and it has a sort of mechanistic uh, grammar. He says Dakota is a relational language. It, it ties people to each other, to the earth, um, to the cosmos, to, uh, to, um, to things in a spiritual way. Um, and, um, and, and, and so the, the limits of language to, to adequately capture, um, you know, everything comes freighted with connotations. Uh, so it, it's a good question, and it's, it's definitely one we struggled with. And I'm not sure if the next generation will conclude that war is the appropriate term. Thank you. So, yeah. we'll you want to go ahead and yeah. Do we like uh, tables to work on questions and we'll take them out? Okay, so the first um, questions that we are going to ask. Um, the panel are questions that Burke and I uh, are very related to questions that Burke and I came up with ourselves. Uh, so those are the first questions that we're going to ask, and then we'll move on to questions that um, diverge from, from that. Um, so our first question, thinking about the difference between created sites versus historical sites, and the difference in speakability, mentioned by the morning speaker, do you think the Minnesota Historical Society has a different responsibility to those sites? How do you reconcile the approach taken with the Dakota War exhibit and acknowledging genocide with these things like having birthday parties and weddings at Fort Snelling? Right, right. And, and so then the next question. Yeah. Are there limits of expression in the classroom in discussions about genocide? and then very closely related. How do we strike a balance between indifference and secondary trauma in the classroom? Can I, so we didn't get a chance to turn our carbon, but I think our question is related, sure. can I just yeah. shout it out? Yeah. So I, we're interested in kind of institutional limitations. Um, so, you know, specifically the Historical Society or the History Center um, in places like Fort Snelling, but then also, I maybe more broadly, the, the idea of, you know, the University of Minnesota being a land-grant yeah. institution, you know, and a settler colonial institution, and, you know, the limitations of having these discussions in this setting. <coughs> yeah. um, well, there's a lot in, in there. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I I should just say, because it's not commonly known, that we discontinued the practice of parties and 
book selling. We're still taking heat for it. <laughs> so, and, and that's completely uh, legitimate because, um, because it, it, it reminds you that decisions that you made many, many years ago have, dur have a durable legacy in public memory. Um, and, um, so, you know, obviously my point of view is it's very regrettable that we ever were so tone deaf as to think about it that way. But I think it illuminates the much larger problem, which is that um, historic Fort Snelling, to just take that as an example, is, um, is largely a reconstruction. It was reconstructed around the same time as the American Bicentennial in the mid-70s. And, um, and it was created very much in that spirit. So it was, it was designed as a, as a monument to westward expansion. I mean, that is just uh, you know, a, a fundamental fact. So, so what is its future as a place? And does it have any value as a monument um, built in that, in that context? And I, uh, and I would say that as an institution, our thought process is that what it stands for might be something else. And whether we can succeed in making it stand for something else um, is, really, is really to be seen. Um, um, but it is our hope that it can be a place that, um, like other sites of conscience around the world, um, uh, it can be a place um, that is candid about um, about westward expansion meant not only to indigenous people but also to um, uh, enslaved people. Um, uh, Japanese Americans um, served at Fort Snelling in the Military Intelligence Language School there, even as their families were interned in, in concentration camps um, throughout the United States uh, during World War II. So, um, so. What I find in, in, intriguing about uh, Fort Snelling and its future as a place for learning is that it could represent evidence. Um, uh, and, and if you think about, um, you know, um, other social critics have, have made the point that, you know, the United States is, a, is an unusual country in the sense that it's not unified by, um, by language or race or by religion. Um, in, in the way other nation states are, um, but it, its genesis begins as a, as, a, as a kind of a litany of ideals, right? And Fort Snelling is a place where um, our stated ideals of, a, of, an inst of, of the institution of our country are in stark contrast to the reality of our actions. And can it be an example where people learn about the problem of the American problem, the distinctly American problem of living according to our national ideals. And that's what I hope Fort Snelling can be in the future. And I don't know if it's possible. I really don't. But it seems to be, as long as it's going to stand there, that that's a, a direction it can go. Yeah. 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 So, um, are there limits of expression in the classroom in discussions about genocide? And how do we strike a balance between indifference and secondary trauma in the classroom? Interesting question. Um, I think. It really makes a difference in the, the environment, of course, that you set up in your own classroom and what kinds of relationships you have with students. Um, you know, so one classroom to another is not going to look the same. Um, and of course, how the, the students have been treated and, and what method they're used to in terms of talking or discussing certain issues. Um, so I start with Socratic seminar very early in the year, actually. You know, when I was teaching seventh grade, I could do it, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, seniors, whatever. Um, so I think once kids learn some of the, the protocol, when you're in that type of situation, the desks or the tables or the chairs are in circles, 
they know when you speak, when you don't speak, they, they have phrases so they know how to say things to each other, but then you've set up a safe space that no matter what the topic is, um, it's okay to talk about. And in terms of limits, if you're talking about certain language or topics, I mean, we pretty much will go anywhere. Um, if someone says something maybe silly or um, offensive, usually someone will either ask, well, what do you mean by that? Or why did you use that term and not this other term? And so they will kind of make a check on each other. Um, so I'm not sure if that's exactly what the question is. Um, but I guess I see that we don't need to limit what kids are saying or even how they say it if they're given a safe space because they're trying to work through how to cognitively deal with and emotionally deal with very difficult subject matter. And unless they have that practice and that safe space, when are they going to do it? Or what are they going to look at as their example? Are they going to look at our president as the example? That frightens me. So I want them to learn how to have conversations that are much more um, open and um, respectful. And so on that note, I do want to apologize for something. Um, Alejandro mentioned that perhaps I should come into a college classroom. It's been a while. And um, classes are, are not um, as structured, perhaps, as they used to be. Or I guess they're still structured, but I was making the uh, statement, you know, got to get up, got to move around, and perhaps some of the classes are. So I do want to apologize for making that type of assumption. <laughs> um, however, I do, I'm going to stick with the idea that I don't know if you guys would make it in a class with, you know, 35, <laughs> yeah. 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds. So I'm going to stick with that one. <laughs> Of course, this brings up the issue of the ethos of the um, instructor and the character of the instructor. Um, emotional intelligence, I think, was a phrase that somebody used, and uh, it seems to be a really critical thing. Um, but the, the practical realities, I think, of that have to do with the, the challenge of becoming available uh, to people, uh, establishing a relationship with students, and um, finding a way to um, to grade a student's uh, performance such that um, that's not the only power, that's not the primary power struggle that they have in the classroom. And academia is notorious for its uh, commencement end of cum laude's and, and other things that people have you know, used to, to climb into various opportunities. But um, this particular subject matter um, may lend itself more to uh, a different way of thinking. I don't have the answer for this, but um, I have tried a few things. And um, in my anti-Semitism class, I actually had a, a, a rather objective matching midterm that was really unusual for me. But the kind of preparation we went through to get to that point involved their construction of the concepts that were going to be matched. And so it was part of an experience that they were very much involved in. Uh, one other thing is that um, being a, aware as an individual about how you're communicating. Um, I, there was a, a woman in my anti-Semitism class this semester who, as it turns out, um, experienced a very abusive relationship. And I was talking about the kinds of influences that sometimes people use in certain situations. And um, there was something that was brought up because of the stabbing that happened in Crossroads Mall earlier this year. And so students were talking about various weapons and uh, the use of guns <coughs> and such. And so I said, you know, you don't even have to use a gun. You can just have it sitting on the table and refer to it or, or just touch it and it sends a message. And I had no idea that um, she had been in an experience where her husband did exactly that. Um, and so she was in the midst of a, of a divorce. We never really know what our students are bringing to the classroom. But I think this is where I, I really struggle as an academic. I really don't know who I am. Um, I really want to be in the ideas. But the way a student encounters this stuff is just there, it's, there's a lot of variable there. Some students do take it and dissect it. It's very objective. Um, I've had a couple students who were very interested in a Holocaust literature course about the vehicles that were used in World War II, including the trains. And uh, 
they wanted me to call it, not use the word cattle car, because they weren't cattle cars, I was informed. And uh, this was shocking to me, um, because I had been using that term. And um, <laughs> as it turns out, um, mi very minimally cattle cars were used. It was rail cars and other forms. But I found out from Simone Gigliotti, I don't know if, um, you, yeah, the train journey, speaking about the tellability of these things. Um, that's a whole other thing. I want to just add something about the um, secondary trauma, since I kind of forgot about that part of the question. Um, certainly, there are students from so many areas that are coming into our classrooms, and um, since I do a lot of simulations and role plays, I'll always make sure that there's kind of like a, a safe or an out. Um, and I try to talk to students before we do, you know, whatever that particular simulation is, so they kind of have a heads up. Um, because there can be some events or, you know, they've come from a refugee camp and here I'm doing a simulation on refugees and, and actually last summer some of you who were here, you were part of that and we, we talked about, you know, whether we should be doing that type of activity um, and what that, um, what dangers or, or things that we need to be aware of um, and so I guess that's how I, I try to handle that piece. So again, maybe talk to a student if, you know, to give them a heads up and then tell the whole group that you know, if at any time you need to leave or you want to just step out, here's your safe card and you can do that. Well, I don't teach in a classroom, but as I'm thinking about this question of indifference and secondary trauma, I think of our own Jewish community and the, the generations after group and the descendants of Holocaust survivors and the ones that want to gather because they want to discuss how they're feeling and what they've inherited and what it means to them and if they see rights of incidents and anti-Semitism they get alarmed and you know so there's sort of that that mentality and then there are people who very much are descendants and, and distance themselves from it and you know can't can't we put that behind us keep, why do you keep talking about it you know so it's it's really different in our for groups and you know in the Jewish community that that we engage with. I have two more questions. Um, so the first, shame was identified as a or the major outcome in response. Um, sorry, I can't read that word. Um, so yeah, just just shame is a response pretty much um, by the second speaker. Um, is shame inevitable, desirable, common? And how should we understand and work with it? Um, and the second question is, how do you deal with deniers? <laughs> I have no idea how to deal with shame. <laughs> um, no, um, I've actually been, been trying to dig into the literature about this, and I do think this is a really important piece of the puzzle. And, um, and I, think, I, think, I think that this goes to the question of identity, um, that people externalize their own sense of identity, and, and whether it's a sense of filial piety uh, to their own ancestors, or whether they there's a sense of, a, of allegiance. And when you, when you pull the cover off of something, um, um, you know, there are, there, there are a variety of reactions that people have. Um, and I think museums in particular are, are pretty ill-equipped um, to deal with, with those re responses because the people who are working in the galleries are not trained to respond to those things, <coughs> probably, not even all that ready or willing to share how they're feeling with museum staff anyway. Um, the nature of museum visiting is, is voluntary and social, and so um, a lot of the chemistry of what's happening with people is tending to, ha to happen within a, a social visiting group, often family members and so forth. Um, and so, um, so people, uh, people's inclination is to say, well, if depredations 150 years ago were visited on native people by white people, I feel ashamed as a white person. I mean, that's, that's what we're, we're saying, it, it is the expression. What I'm interested in as a strategy in the future is to think about how do you, instead of internalizing that as a sense of shame, how do you understand that, um, that there's a responsibility there, but, but 
It's really about how you live in the future, right? How do you understand the past as a platform for being better in the future, whether it's shifting from being a bystander to an upstander, um, to see your responsibility um, to, to other people, to people who are different from yourself, or people who have, his, have been historically um, marginalized. How do you um, find some place of empathy there? So the shame response really is, I think, um, at some fundamental level, on some fundamental level, perhaps a destructive reaction. It's a way of assuming um, guilt for one's ancestors um, and, and is not about thinking about how this responsibility might be a platform for future um, action. And, um, and so, um, so I think it's a predicament. I don't know um, the, the, the answer to it, but as a, but as a, as a museum person uh, who's looking for informed discipline, I do, I do see it as the challenge of the future to try to think about how, um, how people understand history in ways that are productive and meaningful for the future. I beg your pardon, but the shame topic is, uh, I think, a very important one because, yeah. I mean, we're talking two days about such mass atrocities that I think the most more normal reaction of somebody who has a bit of sensitiveness and knows and understands that it's his ancestors who've committed these crimes, I think it's quite a normal reaction that you yeah. feel shame and you feel guilt. And so the challenge in there, I would, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, see it as something destructive, but I think it's normal. And where I'm totally with you is that I think we have to discuss how do we lead people from this very normal and I think not false reaction to a process of dealing with it in a constructive way and not to remain in this stop turn around. Stop yeah. Take One word about that. Um, in the uh, Alsace-Lorraine area, there, I can't even remember the town, it might be uh, Reisach, uh, there's a woman who's a psychologist and she's been working with um, an entity called the Blue House, which has been trying to reconstruct Jewish history in that yeah, particular uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And so she's created, at least I, several years ago, she created an exchange um, with um, Jewish survivors, children, and high school kids from um, Germany as well as, I think, Poland. That's very interesting. Um, Bradley Smith is the name of a, a Holocaust denier. He's since passed not such a blessed memory as a Holocaust denier, but he was a human being. I didn't know him personally, but back in 2003, he managed to get a 30-page insert into our University Chronicle, uh, which caused quite a stir. Um, all the people who um, recognized what that meant came out. There was a big rally. They burned the insert, and the woman who set the torch to it um, just admitted to me about it three months ago that she is embarrassed that she did that. Um, since then, uh, Bradley Smith has gotten into the newspaper two other times. And once I was just about ready to present at a commemoration in Kigali, Rwanda, when he wrote me an email informing me, thanking me for letting him get into our newspaper again. Um, malicious guy. Uh, but what I did was I met with the faculty advisor of the, um, of the paper, actually, and I found out that this guy had been abused by other people on campus that didn't like what they were publishing. And I bought him a beer and we had a conversation. And so it's a building of a relationship that out of which came um, a kind of responsibility taking um, that he stepped into. And I, it's a question of how you pass that knowledge and awareness down to the next generation of editors in the paper because it's a transitory population. Uh, but that's just within that framework. Um, in a classroom um, experience and in that context, I'm very concerned 
being interested in the question about the split between social studies and communication arts and literature, in, in particularly in middle and high school. Because I think going down only one of those routes is mm -hmm. problematic. Mm -hmm. And some people who are social studies teach it with an understanding of the literary and, and the other dimension. Um, but there are people who teach the literature and don't quite get the history. And both of them feel limited. And I think that actually within this domain, this discipline, um, we could do more than we are. From what you just said, Dan, I was thinking how um, one of the arguments is that history teachers were angry that the English department has stolen stolen the Holocaust um, because they read Knight or they read Anne Frank or something. We actually were having that conversation last week at lunch. It's like that'll be interesting. I'm going to share that at the conference. Um, so yeah, there's you know we want to teach this. You know, no, we want to teach this, but um, that's just a side note um, regarding deniers. Um, I've never had a student say they deny the Holocaust, um, but there are students who um, are climate deniers. So, it, but if they are basically saying they deny or don't agree with whatever, you know, the vast majority of historians or scientists or whomever say this is how things are, we look at it from it from looking at the evidence, and that's of course part of what we need to be teaching kids all the way through is look at evidence, look at evidence. What does the evidence say? What's your source for this? Um, whether we're reading a text or whatever we're doing, and if we have enough evidence, then this is why we, we believe this. You know, we're going back to the bigger question, how do we know what we know? Well, we know this because all of these other things that we can trace. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's how I deal with it in class. Sixth grade, but that's okay. Minnesota history, and yeah. in Minnesota, that's the year that they do Minnesota history. But it used to be in seventh grade, oh, okay. and so yes, 20 years ago, I taught it in seventh grade. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just what, okay, if so, yeah. you can respond to um, prejudice and um, and um, feelings of guilt in that context, specifically in Minnesota. Um, teaching in Minnesota classrooms, if you can respond in that way. My guess is there's probably teachers in the room that might even be able to answer that. But are there any sixth or seventh grade teachers? No? Okay, I guess I will be the representative. Um, and for one thing, it's been a long time since I taught it, but I, I don't feel like anyone in the classroom had a sense of, of guilt. It was just like, wow, we never heard this. We never knew that, you know, things happened in Minnesota, whatever those things are. You know, that their local place is, is without history, which is a whole different thing that perhaps we should be really worried about as educators. It's like, why do you think your place isn't in Um And this is the first year I started teaching human geography, and so we're really trying to go to, let's look at our local place and what does that mean and all the different layers that are part of that. Um, so there wasn't really any, any guilt related to uh, the Dakota War. Um, the kids were just very interested like they are with really any topic of uh, looking at Cambodia or whatever. They just like want to know what happened and why people would do that. Um, so I don't know. That's really, I guess, all I can say about that. Um, as far as the History Center, they, they do have a textbook that's used, and I think for the most part it's fairly decent as far as the textbook goes, although I don't really like textbooks. Um, I, I don't know, my kids say, wow, you took the textbook out. This is like the second time. <laughs> we're looking at this map on page whatever. I mean, we don't really use that. We use you know, several different sources. And unfortunately, I think some teachers really rely on the textbook, and of course, there's a lot of issues with that, and I'm sure I don't need to tell this crowd. Um, but, I, but I know that a lot of teachers, they, if they don't know a topic, they want a textbook so they have a place where they can start. And I look at it like, well, if you start with the textbook, chances are you're not going to go any further because you think that that's the answer. And if this is your chance, as you're creating curriculum, is to find other sources and other voices. Because once you're stuck in this, you think that's the way it is, and then that's what you've learned. And I've found that as a problem, and I hope there aren't elementary school level teachers here, because they're teaching so many you know, different areas, they don't have as much content knowledge 
And so they really rely on the textbook because they kind of have to. But now, like in middle schools, there they are. They all wanted to use the Minnesota history textbook, where my colleagues who have a history degree or you know they've been trained more in history, they're like, you know, they don't even use it. So that I think that's a real concern um, in in education is to make sure that you know multiple perspectives, viewpoints, texts are being used. And text doesn't always have to be right reading and writing, text, you know, video, art, whatever. But I'm getting, I think, off the question. Sorry. Um, I just want to speak to this because um, for years I taught multicultural literature and we always did an American Indian unit and you asked about prejudice and I think in Minnesota the one of the largest myths that students have is that all Indians are rich now because of the casinos. That's what I was confronted with all of the time. And even when um, I had American Indian students who were in tribes that did not get money from a casino, um, the other white students didn't believe that. They tried to discredit when someone tried to tell the truth. I, and when that first happened, I was so shocked. Um, I, I didn't know quite how to respond to it. So of course what I had them do was to do some research and started having them research different tribes, not only um, the tribe that we were reading a novel from and learning about that, that tribe, we were reading a memoir, I should say, from. Um, and that seemed to help, too. They've just got a broader understanding. But in Minnesota, that's what I found the most, was that, that myth that all Indians now are rich because they get money from the casinos, and they don't have to work or do anything, but they get that money. So that, I just wanted to add that, because that was part of your question. I'll, I'll yeah. just, uh... So I'll, I'll just um, preface this where I'm not currently teaching my own classroom, but my major was American Indian Studies, and I student taught in the Minnesota Studies classroom. So I did get at least some experience with it, and one of the ways that I dealt with a lot of prejudices uh, was because in the Twin Cities, I, you know, we, we don't actually think about a lot of the urban populations, but the vast majority of American Indians are in urban areas because of U.S. policies placing them there, uh, which is, you know, if you go by the, the U.N. definition of genocide, could definitely be considered in that, you know, the definition. But um, one of the ways I dealt with it was by starting with the present. You know, and, and by, by humanizing people who are all around them. You know, and I think that's one of the things that um, was very helpful for me before I talk about the U.S. Dakota War even. We're watching a Tall Paul rap video mm -hmm. that is specifically in the Twin Cities. Or we're looking at Vervian Tall Chief, who is the, the U.S.'s first prima ballerina. Um, so, so looking at real people who, who they should hopefully be seeing all around them because there are survivors, you know, and, and this isn't a, a finite history. And I think that's where a lot of that comes in, is that we see uh, not much into the 20th century except for very romantic portrayals. Um, so that's, that's my take. <laughs> So, well, we are, when I mentioned the police officer that expressed denial <coughs> with the training, so what we'll do, we've held a meeting with um, the person that plans the next training, and we're talking about changing um, the messenger, who's the trainer. We're talking about different resources to give them ahead of time. Um, we invited this particular unit and the superiors to, we hosted, um, Father Patrick Dubois in Minneapolis. We thought, what a fabulous opportunity. It's all about the evidence, the forensics. And um, unfortunately, as you can imagine, the person, the police officer did not come, but his superiors came. And so we're just gonna continue to hopefully get them resources, have more conversations about exactly what the denier, what, what exactly is going on, right? Is it really against 
the history? Is it against Jewish people? Is it something <coughs> political? So we're kind of investigating a little bit more. Can I say something else about denial? Um, there are probably a number of reasons why people um, get into that. Um, in 2011, we were fortunate enough to uh, collaborate with the U of M when Bruno uh, Schwab was the interim director. Uh, we brought Deborah Lipstadt um, to Minnesota. She was here in the Twin Cities. She came up to St. Cloud. Uh, we did a little videotaping of her presentation up there. We have it on YouTube, but just uh, last week I got two emails randomly from, well, I thought they were random. Uh, I don't really know who they came from, but both of them were clearly Holocaust denial, aimed directly at Deborah Lipstadt. And uh, when this question came up for her at a seminar at, at the USHMM, she said, well, never engage a denier. And um, she was speaking about that from her perspective, you know, on the circuit, but um, there is a dimension, I think, uh, the extent to which a person carries around a baggage of being wounded, and part of that, the, the base of that is, is a hate and a frustration, and there, you know, there are other psychological terms that um, somebody in psychology could probably unpack this for us, but uh, there was a veteran who came to the center, had a backpack, started pulling out one article after another, um, asking me to refute these claims, and um, I, by the end of the conversation, um, I just asked him about his life. He was living with his mother. He had been injured. Um, he broke down. He cried. And uh, he was clearly on the edge of denial. And I said, I hope I can talk to you again. Um, Menaza Fridi, who is uh, the only female Muslim director of a Center for Holocaust and Genocide Education at Manhattan College, uh, came to St. Cloud State. She's got a book on the Holocaust through Muslim eyes. And the challenge of Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism in the Muslim community sometimes takes on a particular character, but there was something profound that happened in her perspective in validating the lives of people who were wrapped up in the Holocaust, were victims as well, and even hid Jews, and that's part of her narrative. One last thing, Derek Black, um, maybe some of you have heard of him. Um, he was a white supremacist up and coming. Um, created the website specifically for young people. Uh, there was a Jewish guy who reached out to him at the school he went to and had Shabbos dinner with him, invited him to Shabbos dinner um, repeatedly. And this guy has completely refuted his. He was the uh, godson of David Duke. And um, sometimes hate is at the core of denial. And uh, what? How do you fight hate? With love? Um, I, I, I would just like to um, add that um, as part of part of our um, work as an institution to try to um, uh, deal better uh, with people who are not like the kinds of people who traditionally have worked at the Minnesota Historical Society, is to uh, um, is to do something that's called the um, intercultural development inventory. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a um, it's a very short sort of um, question-based survey, and what it helps to do is plot you plot your own um, development on a spectrum um, in terms of your um, your your abilities to, to work um, outside of your own culture, um, and um, and it was very useful for me partly just to kind of understand where I was in my own development as a human being. Um, and my capacity for, for working with people who are different from myself. Um, but it, but it, also, it also gives you meaningful feedback on things that you can do to advance along that continuum. And what's interesting is that the very first stage on this continuum is denial, right? And, um, and, and denial, it, when you're at that particular stage, it's, it's, it's quite... Um, uh, it correlates very strongly with being culturally isolated. Um, and so your, your tendency to see um, others as um, irreconcilably different from yourself um, has a lot to do with your um, lack of experience uh, with people outside of yourself. And it also has a lot to do with your sense that affording anyone else um, 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 uh, recognition 
for their experience um, is somehow an attack on your own um, sense of experience or identity. Um, the next stage is minimization. And I, I would say that in our work um, around the 1862 commemoration, that um, we, we encountered this probably the most. And it was also a place that a lot of people working at the Historical Society were, were, had a tendency to go to in their thinking. And, and what minimization is about is, is saying, all right, well, I recognize that, that you've suffered. You, this other person, have suffered. But, but hey, we suffer too. Everybody <laughs> suffers, you know. Or I recognize you as a Native person have a really difficult time dealing with our institution on certain issues. But it's difficult for everybody who tries to inter interact with our institution. It's difficult for me to work here because of, for the same things that you're experiencing. So minimization is, 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 a, is a kind of a habit of thinking. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's something that once you're aware of, of it being a kind of a, a place that you are likely to go in your thinking as a person, um, you know, a lot of this has to do with your sense of awareness. Um, acceptance is the next uh, place on that continuum. And then finally, there's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of a sense of capacity. But what's great is that once you get your diagnosis, <laughs> one of the things you learn is that you think you're farther along the continuum than you actually are. But, but, but there's also, you know, actionable advice that you get off of this. You know, and, and for me, one of the things was you just need to spend more time with people who are different from, from yourself. And so I, I took that to heart. And that's part of the reason why we started going to other places and hanging out with people and spending a lot of time in the casinos and I even I, I hate to admit it but I even took up smoking again because I, I couldn't you know I couldn't be in the uh, in the casino <laughs> <That's> <laughs> rather than smoke yeah. um, and a lot of Indian people smoke so you know um, um, so I think I think um, yeah, there are tools out there that help us not only make meaning out of what we perceive in other people's resistance, but also help us as individuals grow in meaningful ways to get self-insight, because that's what the challenge is. How do, how do I understand my own habits of thinking, my own cultural uh, pre, uh, proclivities um, and, and biases, the blinkers that I have? And everybody's got them. You know, how, do you, how do you understand those and, and work forward in that? deliberate fashion, because it is possible. Well, thank you all. I think we're just about out of time. Um, thank you all. I'm sorry we can get to all of your questions, and hopefully the conversation can continue after the conference. If you would join us in thanking our panelists one last time. you will pick up a flyer um, over at the resources table in the back of the room um, and join us on May 3rd and other dates as well. Um, we also have an event coming up on just on Monday with Philip Spencer, who's here today, and um, one of our uh, faculty members, um, Bruno Chalot. Um, there aren't many of these flyers left, but the information is on our website, so you can be sure to check there. Um, and then, of course, um, there's a Witnesses to the Holocaust book um, from the JCRC, or Zell's institution. Um, we have several copies, so please, if you haven't taken one, go ahead and take one. Um, today they're here to 
we dig in. So, um, and then just for any educators to make sure um, that you've checked in with Katie in the back of the room, um, so that we can be sure to give you the the uh, CEU credit for today's um, session. So just check with Katie before you leave and make sure that she's checked you off the list. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say I was handing out some handouts that I brought that have some good resources in the box on them. Um, and I didn't hit everybody, so there's a staff right there if you want to get one. Thoughts by organizing. I mean, this is probably, I should say this, it's probably a concluding thank you and concluding farewell, and particularly this thank you to all our presenters, those who are from Minnesota, those who traveled uh, here from outside the country, from the country, from the country, from outside the country, from Europe. Thank you to all for coming. I'd like to thank also very especially to the educators who participated in. Today's Institute. We hope to see you again. It's most good to see faces that have already been in our Institute. And a um, uh, very important uh, thank you to Jennifer Hammer, Program Coordinator of the to, to, to Jennifer, I want to thank Katie and Emily from the Institute of Global Studies. Uh, students who have chaired wonderfully the sessions and provided excellent questions for the audience, for our speakers, uh, to Sandra and other students who have been so helpful throughout this conference. And I'm Feinstein had originally laid, and uh, I think he added a uh, scholarly dimension to it without however ne neglecting the outreach function that a center like this also has. And um, uh, we, this I think is the third symposium that you had organized with, with uh, major, major efforts and uh, resources from many Places the idea for this uh, for this theme is one that we've been discussing for uh, four years or so. We had a symposium four years ago on, on representations of genocide, and um, and in the final discussion, one of the contributors challenged the name of the center and said uh, we should maybe move away from calling something Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and just call it. Centers for Genocide Studies because the way the name now is framed elevates the Holocaust uh, from, from uh, other events of similar nature. And, and we thought this would be worthy of a discussion and this is the discussion we initiated and all of you 
contributed in, uh, and made this a rich event, and we are profoundly grateful. It's an event that uh, I've had the pleasure to work with Alejandro on a number of occasions. We've become friends in the process. We are colleagues, and it is a collaboration between the son of refugees from Nazi Germany and the son of a Wehrmacht soldier, and uh, maybe uh, that says something about uh, historical development also. So I thank you all very, very much for your contribution and for being here.